Thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Super excited to finally get you on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I am completely technologically illiterate. <laughs> uh, I'm almost 40 years old and don't let that be a function of my age. It's just my function of my inability to want to keep up with the times. But yes. uh, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Russian immigrant okay. came here in 1989 with my family right before the collapse of the Soviet Union, settled uh, in the East Coast in Connecticut, lived there my basically my whole life. First person to go to college, went into finance, spent seven years at a trading desk, reconciling bank accounts, and basically spending every ounce of money I made on uh, drugs and booze and travel. Um, <laughs> you know, as a as a twenty five year old kid with a lot of money will do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I was always kind of into fitness. I got into fitness early on in my life because of just vanity. Uh, yeah, I want I wanted to connect with with, with chicks really, honestly, yep. like I just, I just wasn't getting any attention and the football guys were. So I started training with them and <laughs> I was an awful athlete, but I was a really good weightlifter. Okay. Uh, and the two things are different. And I'm sorry for anybody who's like a weightlifter or like a bodybuilder. And then you keep yeah. saying you're an athlete. Like, I'm sorry, you're just not, you're moving shit around. <laughs> um, if that offends anybody, come right after me on my Instagram page. I'm happy to talk <laughs> to you about it. Like athletes move in multiple directions and have skill sets. Pulling a bar off the ground is not an athletic endeavor. Right. It's a strength endeavor and it's impressive yeah, shit, but like for sure. me, me building a physique. They're not one in the same. No, no. They're like, not one in the same. And my Achilles rupture on September 17th proved that. <laughs> oh, ouch. Sorry, bro. That sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun. I just got the uh, I just got the cast off yesterday, but now we're okay. still not weight-bearing for another four weeks. Oh, um, that sucks. So finance kind of kicked me out. The industry changed a lot. I got laid off in 2012, and after years of people telling me I should be a fitness trainer or a trainer in general, I finally went and pursued that, got my NASM, started working for a big box gym in Greenwich, Connecticut called Equinox, which is kind of a high-value brand. Yeah. Uh, realized very quickly that it was a broken system and a broken model. Education was great. They offered 150 yeah. hours of education there. EFTI was fantastic. Exposed me to a lot of good biomechanics stuff, prehab, rehab stuff. But then I realized that, like, just training people on the floor just wasn't cutting it. Like they just weren't getting the results because they spent the rest of the 23 hours a day doing everything they could to mess it up right. subconsciously probably. Sure. Sure. So I started realizing that nutrition, psychology, mindset was also so much more important in getting people results. And my aim was always to disseminate information to the general population. So that's when I started my Instagram account. I ended up moving from Connecticut to California in 2021 because I was tired of the East Coast and COVID presented a unique opportunity for me to get the hell out of there after spending a year of training people underground uh, for yeah. cash. And then my business yeah. blew up. So I just took all that money and I moved out here on a whim by myself with nobody, no connections, no network, nothing. And started from the ground up all over again for the third time in my life as a 38-year-old man. Wow. Um, so yeah, a lot of shit has happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So- Talk to me a little bit more. Like you said, you got into this for vanity. And I think if we're being honest, a lot of us do, right? <laughs> it's like, hey, some of us are in it for the sport performance game. But, you know, even those guys and gals, a lot of times there's like a side benefit to it. So talk to me about your beginning. Like who influenced you? Who got you like excited about training? Uh, honestly, we were just like the exploratory experimental meatheads at 15 years old. Like we would go into, it was called the, it was called physique plus. That was the gym in our town in Cheshire, Connecticut. Okay. There was this massive, like 60 year old former bodybuilder and named, named Charlie who would make these like protein muffins. And he was, <laughs> he was like the first nutrition coach that I'd ever really heard of. Like he was helping people with nutrition. And back then it was like just meal plans. So there was no semblance of like macronutrition profiles sure. or anything like that. It was just like, buy these supplements, eat these muffins, eat these meals, and you'll get skinny. And that's all people gave a shit about was skinny because we were living right. in a town that was relatively upper middle class, affluent. So people didn't really care about physique. They cared about being the smallest version of themselves. Huh. Um, I got really lucky because our strength and conditioning coach in, in my, on our high school football team, which I already told you I sucked as an athlete, he was just really smart. He played defensive end at UConn and – you know, had a couple of accolades and then he went on to coach some CFL teams and stuff like that. And he was just very smart about training. Like he, I wouldn't say that he was biomechanically a genius. Sure. But the stuff, like he was, he was, he was very much a subscriber to bro science. And we all know that bro science is now being proven left and right to be true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, like as much as we don't want to admit it, but like PubMed yeah. is backing, backing us up now. Yeah. So, 
he was like my first entry into understanding like the relationship between results and grit. Mm. But he was never like an asshole about it because our football, our head football coach was a prick. Yeah. Like he motivated in a very negative way. Like you're fat, you're slow, you're stupid, you'll never get it. Right. Whereas our strength and conditioning coach was the kind of guy that would walk into our locker room before a football game and he would literally walk in with a chainsaw and just start like slicing shit in half. <laughs> and like just That's like awesome. blaring limp biscuit, making us do like a hundred sets of shrugs just yeah. to like build our traps up to look scarier. Like that he was yeah. just like an old school blue collar guy. And yep. he taught us the value of work ethic. And work ethic took us a very very long way. Like we were one of the yeah. strongest, strongest, fastest teams in football in Connecticut. I was probably one of the top three lifters in Connecticut for a while in my weight class um, with really just, I would honestly say like, not like I want to say minimal effort, but it just kind of came naturally. Sure. And then like, that's when we started to separate the men from the boys. Like when I got to college and I was still powerlifting, I realized how weak I really was. Yeah. Because like me being part of the 1200 pound club was dog shit yeah. <laughs> compared to some of these, <laughs> you know, and I didn't know anything about gear back then. I didn't know about performance enhancing drugs. Like I was always like, oh, I'm never going to take that stuff. It's so bad for you. Like even I wouldn't even touch creatine. Right. Like I was so deathly afraid, like protein powder was as far as I ever went. So, you know, my entry to fitness was very, I, I guess you could say it was very, um, kind of rudimentary but it was very the the basics always stuck with me yeah like i, I just yeah. always realized the power of the basics because the basics is what people just never wanted to believe in and i'm like all it just takes is just repetition over time right and, isn't it amazing when you get on like that first power lifting program you've been like doing all the pump fluff stuff you want in the gym and you get like serious about like no i'm just going to get strong and then all of a sudden you're like dude like literally i'm doing like these four or five basic lifts but i'm just like pushing Every time I'm in the gym and it's amazing, you're like, dude, all of a sudden you're a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. You're like, dude, why was I ignoring this the whole time, right? Yeah. And, you know, we got kind of by default were put on like a power building program Yeah, where we had some elements of hypertrophy. And again, this is not by design. Like This guy was far from a genius. Sure. But he did it in a way where I think he just accidentally designed a very good program. Like he was like, it was yeah. basically like, here are your three main lifts, your bench squat, your deadlift. But then here are all these accessories. Yeah. And and he he forced us to kind of focus on the accessories as much as the big lifts. Yeah. Which I was that like goes a long way. Which now when I look back at it cuz I have worked with some strength athletes and just by default and I've seen what other strength athletes are doing and the reason why so many of these guys are getting hurt and they have no longevity in the game is because they spend all their time with the barbell and they never spend any time doing single leg work or single arm work or rotational yeah. work or anti-rotational work and you're looking at them and you're like, well, you could be so much better because you're already there. Like you're already at the right. top of your game. Right. But for you to get from like C to D, you can't do the shit you did from A to B. Right. And yeah. You're already good at the barbell stuff. Like stop doing the shit you're good at. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Put that on the back burner. Do all the stuff that you suck at and you'll probably see another jump in your performance. I love yeah. it. And that's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's how I, that's how I deal with my clients. It's like, I'm not going to make you do the stuff you're good at. Like that's already cemented into your game. Like you're already, that's part right. of your day. Let's, let's focus on the shit that we're bad at. Yes. I love it. Okay. Last but not least, talk to me about where you're at now. Like what you're doing, what a day looks like. Just give me an overview of your world and what you're doing in it. So I'm like the old man standing at his window, yelling at the kids on his front lawn. Um, <laughs> like I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little bit younger than you are, but I'm very disgusted with the direction of our industry. Yeah it's gotten away from being focused on the end user and the client. And it's gotten to be all about the person who's po posting shit on Instagram and trying to make as much money as possible. Yes. And I am vehemently against it because at the end of the day, if I wanted to stay rich or be rich, I would have stayed in finance. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like you can yeah. make a ton of money in this industry and people certainly do. And there are some people who do it with some level of integrity, yep. but by and large, I'm seeing a lot of influencers and I'm not seeing a lot of educators. And that's why, like, connecting with guys like you, Luca, Joel, like, all these other people that I truly and, – and, 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 and not that I want to be, like, ageist about it, but let's be honest. Like, the 30-, 40-year-olds who have been in this business for 20, 30 years or are approaching that 20-year mark, they're doing it better than the younger people are because the younger people are being allured by the money, by the accolades, by the clout on Instagram. And that's what they're being fueled by as opposed to – Here's my scope of results that I've been able to create for thousands of clients. And that's what makes me good right. at what I do. And the money's going to come. Like it took me more than a decade to see 10K in a month. Right. 
Like yeah. more than easily more than I never thought in my life I'd ever make ten grand because I'm a fucking poor kid from Russia. I didn't know what the fuck money was. Right. But we got these kids now that are being led into these masterminds for forty thousand dollars a month or whatever the fuck they're paying. And they're being told that they should be making ten grand a month when they have no technical skill set. They're twenty five years old, they live in their parents' basement, they just finished their first certification, they have no idea how to communicate with human beings, let alone adults, and they have no idea how to manage money, period, or manage a business. But they're being sold this line of bullshit because they're making a ton of money. These business coaches are making so much money and they're ruining our industry because they're getting away from the personal attention and the personal touch. Because I still think and I truly believe as a coach, you're still a personal trainer. Yeah. Like even if you're not true. I mean, and by the way, like anybody that's like a macro coach and doesn't actually consider training when they're prescribing macros is not doing it right. Right. Like energy systems are real. Like yeah. glycolytic, like glycolytic oxidative considerations need to be taken yeah. before you assign somebody a macronutrition profile. Yeah. Like how could you not consider training? Like you just assigning arbitrary numbers to a person when you have no idea how intensely or how frequently they train is the dumbest thing on the, on the planet, but sure. that will disqualify how many coaches from being coaches. And so I'm just, I'm like, I'm like the disgruntled anti-influencer and <laughs> my, my day to day is spent very much client forward. Like I'm, I'm very available, probably almost to a fault. Everybody has my cell phone number. Everybody's encouraged to text me on a daily basis. I'm reviewing video form check on, on a daily basis with all my clients. I'm responding to food catastrophes. I'm responding to, <laughs> hey, I'm not feeling well. Like I'm gen pop all the way through. Yeah, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, 35 years old plus, broken metabolism. Oh, yeah. Told that their hormones are fucked, all this other oh, stuff. And that's yes. the stuff that I'm trying to beat every day. And then the other aspect of what my, what I'm doing is I created this event called the Real Coaches Summit, which I held for the first time back in March. And the intention of the event was to basically fill the void of education that I'm seeing in the space. So it's to highlight highly experienced, highly successful individuals who have had a track record of, of not only mentoring other coaches, but also getting results for clients. And then giving newer to intermediate to even maybe advanced coaches a place to source credible education from. I love and it. I've been to so many events where like it's always the same speaker who's talking about the same shit and then they get off stage and they're nowhere to be found. They're not integrating with the crowd. They're not communicating with anybody. They're off in the corner by themselves. They're celebrities. Yeah. Um, and to me, that's just not the way, like if you are already somebody in this industry and you're making plenty of money, like show up for the people in those seats. Cause you were once one of those people. Yeah. And the way that I design my conferences, I don't pay my presenters. I tell them basically like I'll cover your hotel room, just show up and be part of this thing. Because if you believe in this industry, you'll want to help it. And it it very quickly weeds out the people I don't need to be connected with. Cause I saw after the first year who was going to show up and who wasn't. Yeah. And and now I curate an environment that's fun. You know, your ticket includes all your food and all your booze. And I get people liquored up. I give people really great meals. It's in Vegas. (laughs) It's at the Virgin hotel. I want it to be fun because you go to these conferences and like you go get coffee by yourself or you go to lunch with your little click and you never meet anybody. But the value of in-person events is so huge between Luca and between Joel and between like, you know, what Andrew Coates always talks about. Like we connect with one another and we make this industry collectively better because the stuff that you know, I don't know. And the stuff that I know, you don't know. And when we can talk right. in that hallway or we could talk at lunch or we could talk at dinner or over a cocktail, we start to learn about stuff that's almost more important than the shit that they're teaching on the stage. Yeah. So that was the intention behind the event. And it's now it's in its second year and it's starting to get a little bit of traction. But like, I don't, I don't make money off of it. I don't plan to make money off of it. This is very much a grassroots approach. And everything that I do is very much from a place of how can I help you versus what are you going to do for me? I love that. I love that. And we're, we're going to talk more about the summit because I think it's such a fascinating concept. And I love some of like the language and marketing, but we'll come back to that. What I want to do first is just like, give everybody that's listening in an overview of just who you are, like your training philosophy, your nutrition philosophy. So would you just start with like your overarching big rocks, right? If somebody comes to a ROM and they say, man, talk to me about training. Like, how should I be training? What are you, what are your beliefs in nutrition? Just give us that general overview. So we know where you're coming from. In my belief. And from what I'm seeing, at least from the general population is most people just want to look the part. Like mm-hmm. some, like most of the people that are consuming your content, my content, they're, they're not like wet behind the ears. They don't, they don't, they're not unaware that McDonald's three days, three times a day is not good for them. <laughs> right. You know, they're not, a, they're aware that they should be moving their body in some 
frequency with some intensity, but they don't really have the why behind it, nor do they have the mechanistic understanding of how these things are supposed to work. So their, uh, their expectations are unrealistic and are formed by the other bullshit that they see on Instagram, because it's much flashier and interesting to give somebody a 12 week weight loss challenge than it is to say, here's your 12 year plan. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring the simplicity back into it by giving them the understanding of why training modalities like hypertrophy based training are going to benefit them more than something like CrossFit. And it's not because I'm against CrossFit, I'm against group training. I think those are great entry level ways into movement, using barbells, understanding the fundamental movement patterns that human beings need to have. But if all you care about, if and this is where like goal setting and understanding the client is so huge. Like if you were to ask Mrs. Jones, do you care about your back squat number or do you care more about having a nicer ass? <laughs> yeah, and, that's a very simple answer right there, man. Right. Like nine, <laughs> out of, nine out of 10 45 year old women who are 40 pounds overweight don't give a fuck about how much they squat. So right. why are you making them barbell back squat constantly? Like, yes, yeah, sure. Should we, should they have some proficiency under the barbell with confidence? Yeah. Sure. But they don't, they're not in our ecosystem long enough for us to be able to instill all these gems on them. So right. if we only have this person for four to six months, let's build them a program that's directly correlated to their level of need and results. So I'm going to lean on hypertrophy training. I'm going to lean on machines. I'm going to lean on stability, loadability, safety. Like I don't need somebody having to sit there and play around with their rib cage for four hours trying to figure out a back squat (laughs) when I can put them into a V squat or into a Smith machine and just get the loadability up and have them feel what they're supposed to feel in their glutes. So my approach is very linear. And like I know that that can seem dogmatic because Lord knows I can go off to the right and left if I need to. Sure. But for 99% of the population who are trying to just look better and be a little less fat and a little bit more visibly muscular, they don't need all the fuckery that's being done in these group fitness classes. They don't need all the special corrective exercises that are people throwing at them. It's like, just start moving in a full range of motion, play with your nutrition, understand that you should be eating mostly whole foods three to five times a day, understand portion sizes, know that sleep and food is how you recover, understand how to manage stress, drink your water increase your own exercise activity and you're done. Just right. do that for the next 15 years. And at some point you'll see what you want to see. Yeah. Wow. That's a great answer, man. <laughs> That's great. And I just love how like brutally honest and direct it is because look, you're right. Like sometimes I feel like these exercise routines end up l- looking like either number one, it looks like physical therapy for an hour. Right. And, and look, I get dropped in that bucket all the time. Right. Oh, they just do like correctives and breathing. And I know <laughs> that person's not getting a response, right? They're not getting a response because you've never been in my gym. You've never seen how I train, but it's either that, or it's just like, like you said, we're spending 45 minutes out of an hour teaching technique and not to say that technique isn't important, but like you're choosing the wrong exercise. If it takes you 45 minutes to get somebody to do it correctly. Yeah. I mean like the deadlift was always one of those things where like, of course I want somebody to learn how to hip pinch. Of course. It's going to save their back. It's going to allow them to understand how to move through their hips. But if a person's not getting a barbell deadlift, stop fucking hammering them with a barbell deadlift. Like they don't need, if a person just cares about how they look, they don't need to be a proficient, proficient deadlifter. They need to like RDL with dumbbells or a hex bar or on a machine, stretch their hamstrings, contract their glutes at the top and they're done. Like you don't have to kill, like this person doesn't have the time, nor do they give a shit. Like, (laughs) <laughs> when we went in, right. we went in, like we went into the gym as twenty year olds or fifteen year olds, and we were reading every magazine on earth. We were immersing ourselves into the information, but we had nothing else to do. Like that's all Absolutely. we cared about. Like these people don't have the time, nor do they have the desire. Like one thing I do with all my clients is I build out a three, four, and a five day week template. And there's an exercise bank, and there's movement actions, and there's all these other components, and they can basically put together their own workout should they want to. Do you know sure. how many people out of 65 clients want to do that? Like probably not many. 10 of them actually yeah. submitted workouts for my review. The rest of them were just like, tell me what the fuck to do. Right. Now I tried to change the mindset and shift it into like autonomy based. Like, let me teach you how to do this stuff and like keep me for accountability for the next 20 years. Obviously I need my bills paid, but like if I'm not teaching you this stuff and then you have to hop from program to program or coach to coach, <laughs> At some point, you have to realize that you're the problem as the individual because you're unwilling to learn the basics and the concepts behind why this stuff should work or not work. And if you're that hands off, like the, 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 I think the most detrimental phrase in the English language is I don't want to have to think about it. 
Mm. Like you think about everything else in your life. You think about your kids 24 seven, your job, your yeah. finances, your spouse. Why shouldn't you have to think about your nutrition and training? Like it's just as important. And one of the, mo the most profound things, and I'll be always brutally honest with you. I live in a weed legal state. I'm a cannabis user constantly. I love to smoke at night. That's my glass right. of wine. Last night I was watching, I think it was The Office. I was watching reruns of The Office and they had said <laughs> something about like, <clears throat> when you go to prison, the one thing that is still intact or the few things that are still intact, even to inmates who are considered to be garbage society, they still feed you. They still allow you to sleep and they give you time for exercise. So mm -hmm. think about what the essentials of humanity are. It's movement. It's sleep, it's water, and it's food. So movement, yeah. like just, just exercise alone is so important. And at some point, we have to understand what means what's good, what's better, and then what's best. Because there's no such thing as bad unless it's getting you hurt. Right. Just like there's no bad food unless it's making you anaphylactically ill. So like you have to start to reframe. My, my whole thing with general population is let's understand the spectrum that we live on. Like where are you? in your journey. Are you here? Did you just start? Are you somewhere in the middle where it's really messy and you're in that place where you don't know where to go? Or are you at the tip of the iceberg where we have to just really fine tune every variable and you don't have the flexibility that somebody like in the middle has? Sure. You know what I mean? And, and that's the concept of like what I did from A to B is not what I do from B to C. And it's definitely not what I do from C to D. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really like that. So talk to me about nutrition because I love your IG uh, first off, I just love how basic it is and don't take that in a negative way. Like I think people like you and Joel that have like these like very basic, those kill like where you're getting like thousands or 1200, 1500 likes, like those are killing. But one of the topics you talk about extensively and rightfully so are like myths and misconceptions around nutrition. And like you alluded to, you figured out down the line, Hey, like training is important, but so is nutrition and sleep. What are some of the big myths or misconceptions that you see around nutrition or stuff that you're dealing with every day with the clients that you're dealing, you're talking to? Uh, the fact that everybody wants to immediately dive into a calorie deficit by way of a diet, that's usually a named diet, um, as opposed mm. to understanding what a calorie deficit really means. And, and that's really stemming from the fact that most people don't have an actual nutritional framework to begin with. Like a diet, the second you adopt something like keto or fasting or paleo or whole 30, it immediately puts guardrails up and it gives you a structure. Right. Like I have a structure. I know I eat four meals a day. I know what my macronutrient and calorie targets are. I know which foods make my belly feel the best. That's my framework. If I need to go up in calories, I do. And that's going to be when I'm in a growth phase. If I want to be in a little bit less of a fat loss or more of a fat loss phase, I take that same framework and I just reduce the calories from it right as opposed to me having to adopt something like keto or paleo or this or that people are diving into these things because they lack structure and that gives them rules that they now have to follow and anytime that somebody has a temporary set of rules they're going to dive all into it but then there's no exit strategy there's no actual assembly of a framework post care and there's no understanding of why is this thing even supposed to work like if I go keto and I cut all my carbs out I'm going to probably lose a lot of water. I'll right. probably lose a lot of glycogen. And that's probably where my initial weight loss is going to come from. And then the other part that people are missing is that they don't understand that a calorie deficit needs to be periodized, just like training needs to be periodized. Like yep. we don't want to stay in the same place for too long because of the adaptive processes of the body. So with something like a diet, like most general population people can't comply to a diet for more than six to eight weeks. Right. There's just no way. Like a competitor bodybuilder, sure, 16 weeks shred bodybuilding show on the horizon they're dialed in they don't care about anything else in the world that is their priority sure but for mrs jones who's got three kids and a job and a husband and a house and a social life you think she's going to be able to diet six weeks straight without right. any hiccups whatsoever of course not and her calories are already probably so low for her at maintenance that any meal out any indulgence is going to throw her back into a surplus and now her weight loss is stalled or it's going backwards and she thinks she's a failure versus she just doesn't have the rules in place on an average basis. Like how good is your average day? That's what four weeks to the beach is all about. It's not a promise to get you in shape in four weeks. 
It's the building of foundational habits that if you want to get something accomplished in the next four to six weeks, that's a little bit above your normal, you don't have to rearrange your whole life to do it. You're already there. Your maintenance is so good that you can just amplify from that point. And in four weeks, you're beach ready. Yeah. Oh, I never knew it. Uh, that was like uh, yeah. the mindset behind that. I really like that. Look, like I think it was a year, year and a half ago now, I worked with uh, a guy from Cody McBroom, Tailored Coaching Method. I worked with Trevor Ratsky. He was my nutrition guy for okay. six, eight months. And my wife's a dietitian. So look, there's no shortage of nutrition <laughs> info in my house, right? Uh, but it's a lot different when you have a trainer, right? And you have the accountability there and there's a learning process involved. And I've said this for a while now, like ever since I did that, I just have a better understanding of, I said, what are my macros? Where do I need to be? If I want to ramp up, where do my calories go? If I want to, you know, bump down, lean out, where do my calories go? But I think that's such a critical uh, step in people's journey. Like, and, and I don't know why, but a lot of people have issues with hiring a nutrition coach, right? Everybody just thinks, I'll just get on this diet or I'll do this or I'll follow this person versus man, why not spend six months to a year? You eat every day, right? Every day you're alive, you eat three to five times a day. Why wouldn't you invest six months to a year to really figure out how to fuel your body appropriately and get the most out of your body? A number of reasons, Mike. I think there's shame attached to wanting help. Mm. You know, it's like admitting yeah. like, I can't do this by myself. Like, I, like how, how am I as an yeah. adult who parents children, who has a fruitful job, who makes money, how can I cannot figure this out? Right. And the reality is, is it's, it's probably a lack of knowledge. Number one, lack of awareness, right? Like people don't, want, people still don't want to admit that calories are real, despite, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like right. saying money isn't real. Like calories are real folks. Like I don't care who you are at what point of your journey, you can overeat fucking broccoli if you really wanted to. <laughs> like it's just an energy currency. Like people just don't want right. to accept that. Like you can overeat calories and if you don't know where your calories are coming from because you don't have a plan or you don't have a structure, then it's very easy to overeat. I mean, shit, like Halloween candy two days ago. Right. Like a, a Twix mini is 80 calories, right? Like that little piece of Twix is 80 calories. So how many of those are you subconsciously just throwing down your gullet on a daily basis leading up to Halloween because it's in the office at the candy bowl? Yeah. And you're walking by that thing six times throughout the day. Or like yesterday I was having a conversation with one of my best friends from high school who's 380 pounds who's just a complete disaster. And he's like, I did this to myself because I stopped giving a fuck. Yeah. And he's like, and I was thinking I was being healthy, quote unquote, by just throwing pistachios down my throat. Like one of the most energy dense foods on the planet. Yeah, is it, is it healthy? Anything is healthy or unhealthy. Depends on the spectrum you're thinking about. But again, you can still overeat. Yeah. So something like a nut that's, you know, that's one gram of a nut is nine calories, you know, one gram of fat is nine calories per gram. That's double the amount with, of protein and carbs put together. So if you're eating yeah. nuts as a snack and you're not moderating the amount of nuts you're eating per day, you could be ingesting five to 600 calories per clip without even thinking about it. And it's not very Absolutely. filling. Yeah. So, no. these, so people have a lack of awareness of calories. We also live in a very hyper palatable, convenient world of food now if, if this was a conversation we were having a hundred years ago, there would be no fat people and nobody would have any health problems Yeah, because you'd probably be eating shit that you just saw grow out of the ground or was just alive three minutes ago. But that's not the case right. anymore. Right. So we've gotten away from eating basic whole foods and we are now replacing that with convenience. And then now with stuff like the, this is keto friendly or this is sugar free or fat free. We have all these labels that are now starting to get, make people believe that the version of the food they're eating is better for them purely just because of marketing tactics. And, you know, if you give somebody a plate of tilapia, white rice and broccoli, they're not coming back for seconds and thirds. Right. Like, they're going to eat that plate of, of food and they're going to be like, shit, I'm full. Like my body knows that it's full. Right. Versus like, if you sit down with a bag of Stacy's pita chips, like you can hit the bottom of that bag in 20 minutes and not even know you just ate anything. Right. And it's because that's what that food is designed for you to do. Like Nabisco ain't making money unless you're overeating their food. <laughs> Right. Um, right. So we just, we have a very poor environment of food. We have a lack of fundamental understanding of nutrition and calories. And then we have a ton of mental health problems in which people don't know how to handle stress. They're not resilient to problems and they make impulsive decisions that soothe their soul immediately versus playing the long game and having better coping mechanisms in place. So between psychology, socioeconomic factors, and then just lack of education, we're in, we're in the spot that we're in now. Yeah. 
Well, something else you mentioned up top, you talked about learning how to train, learning how to eat, and you talked about meat. And this is something that I think is so interesting and so impactful because a lot of times people now think, oh, I can just go to the gym three hours a week and I check that box. And I'm like, dude, you use the analogy of a hundred years ago, right? Think about our food sources. Think about how much we moved a hundred years ago. So like, this is what I always come back to. It's like, hey, that's great that you're in the gym for those three hours. And it's great that you're doing this little mobility routine on your own at home. But man, you just got to find ways to move more throughout the day. Like it's that yeah. simple because that's just such a great uh, like litmus test to put things through is what did this look like a hundred years ago? And if you can't say, oh, well, you know, this looks nothing like life would have looked like a hundred years ago. You're probably on the wrong track. Yeah. I mean, I, and again, it's just, it's part of that new convenient society that we live in more mm -hmm. cars, more office jobs. And now people are working from home, which by the way, if you work from home and you still sit at your desk, like shame on you. <laughs> like just, and I, and I get it. Like I've worked in finance. I understand what it's like to be on back to back calls. Yep. But you can also schedule your life better. Like you don't have to comply to all this shit. Like people are so non-confrontational now. They don't want to challenge the norm or society that they're just like, okay, cool. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Like, no, like ha stand up for yourself, stand up and be an advocate for your own health. If you don't want to sit there in back to back meetings that you're not even participating in, turn yeah. the fucking camera off and go stand in your kitchen and make yourself a meal or go pace around while you're on your phone on zoom around your apartment 50 times. And you're going to get 20,000 steps. I was, I was averaging 15,000 steps a day working from home. Wow. 15,000 yeah. before I tore my Achilles. And even yeah. now with a torn Achilles and this beautiful device called the iWalk free that I, that I bounce <laughs> around on, I still average six to 7,000 steps a day. Yeah. So like, there's no fucking excuse. And like, don't complain about fat loss when you're sitting on your ass all day long, a body in motion, pure physics that we learned back in 11th grade is going to burn and require more energy than a body that's standing still. Yeah. Not to mention the blood sugar implications that are going to improve because you're walking more, right? Stan yes. Efferding talks about 10 minute walks after every meal as a blood sugar regulator that's better than metformin. We see evidence of it all the time. The mood boosting abilities of just walking, being outside in nature and hitting, letting the sun go through your eyes. Our boy Andrew Huberman likes to talk about that one all the time. Yep. Just do the stuff that like the body was meant to do. We were like, as a hunter and gatherer and forager, we were averaging thirty to 50,000 steps a day. You are not getting fat being that active. Yeah. It's yeah. A, you can eat 5,000 calories a day and it wouldn't matter Yeah, because you're just moving all the time. And we also know that our metabolism, the way it's structured, we burn more percentage of energy by way of meat than we do by way of exercise. Like all these fitness trackers and all this bullshit that we wear and all these wearables and all these metrics that we see – they don't know how to accurately measure how many calories you're actually burning because they know nothing about you. They know nothing about your body composition and they're just using formulaic ways to figure that number out. I mean, at the most in an hour worth of workout, maybe you're burning 500 calories. Right. May maybe. Maybe. And that's, maybe. that's if you're really, really relatively lean and you're hauling ass. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One more topic while we're in this zone here. I feel like tracking your nutrition is a really hot topic, right? Should you track? Should you not track? I think I know your answer here, but I want to I want to hear your thoughts. Is tracking a good or a bad thing? Uh, like anything else, it depends. I mean, is 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 tracking going to set off a cascade of negative negative action for you as a person? I would probably go deeper and explore why you have a shitty relationship with data gathering. You know, like yeah. if you step on the scale and you freak out, why is it because you don't understand that weight fluctuations are common and where they come from? Um, are you overwhelmed by tracking food because every meal that you eat is from a restaurant that you have no idea how to track? Then yeah, tracking is going to suck. But if you prepare 98% of the food that you put in your mouth, it's pretty easy to weigh and measure it. Right. And why, and like, let's say for example, you were trying to save to buy a house and you had a financial advisor and they told you to monitor your finances, your ins and your outs your expenditures and your collections of money, like you would do that because buying a house is fucking important to you. Right. So if weight loss is that important to you, wouldn't you want to know where you're actually sitting on a caloric level and a macronutrient level to then finally make adjustments on real numbers collected over time versus using assumptions and conjecture? Like I don't know how to estimate five ounces of chicken. Right. I don't know how to estimate 300 grams of white rice or two tablespoons of oil. But we conceptually have no idea how to do that. I've been tracking food for over a decade. 
Right. I weigh and measure food because I want to be armed with information. I have no emotional attachment to that data. Yeah. And, and, but that's the part that we have to really be able to express to our folks is that there needs to be a very much unattached connection to that data. It's just data. It allows us to either make decisions or allows us to understand where we're at. And it's just purely for informational purposes. If you're married to the data, like I have so many people that have an aura ring that like won't work out because their recovery score is not high enough. Sure. Like, how did you feel when you woke up? Did you feel good? Yeah, I felt fine. So why the fuck didn't you work out? Well, my aura ring said I was at 60%. <laughs> okay, so you're going to listen to a thing that's on your finger versus your body and how you actually, and this is why like we're losing all concepts of how, like you, we don't even know if we're full or not. We don't know if we're rested or tired. We don't know how to deal with emotions. Like we're so disconnected from our own body. Yeah. And I know this is like foo foo woo woo stuff, but like that's real stuff. But this didn't happen again 50, 60 years ago when this technology didn't exist. Right. Like you were sick, you knew you were sick, you laid in bed for the rest of the day and recovered. But if you wake up and you like are like, hey, I feel great, and then all of a sudden your whoop tells you that you shouldn't train today, like, okay, whoop, sorry, I'm still gonna go train. Right. Right. <laughs> well, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, it comes down to this emotional attachment that we tether to the scale, right? It's like, if you can untether yourself from that and just look at it objectively, like, look, I went to Mexican last night. I had three margaritas and all of the chips, you know, like there's a reason your scale weight is up today. And so if you can untether the shame or the emotion that's tied to it and just look at it as, hey, I made certain choices and my weight is up or I made better choices and my weight is down. Like the second you can start to untether the emotion from it, I feel like it's so much easier. I just had an entire hour Zoom call last night with my group coaching clients. I'm like, guys, I have to get you to understand that the decisions you make are your own decisions. There's nobody standing there with a gun to your head telling you to eat what you want to eat. Yeah, you, you are not allowed to complain about the choices that you personally make. If I, go, if I decide to drink an entire bottle of vodka and do an eight ball of blood, I am not supposed to feel good in the morning. <laughs> if you decide to eat a half a pint of Ben and Jerry's and five slices of pizza, why wouldn't the scale go up tomorrow? There's GI distress. There's water retention. There's bloating. There's gas. That's your body's way of saying this did not cooperate with me and these are your symptoms now. Right. After 36 to 72 hours, those symptoms will be gone because you'll be probably be back to eating normal food. But when you indulge on the weekends, expect to not feel good. And the more often you indulge, the more often you're not going to feel well. So that cascade, that thing that you're responding to acutely is just inflammation, water retention, gas, and belly distension. So don't make decisions off of those little feelings. Like Those feelings are supposed to be there because that's your indication that your behavior needs to be adjusted. And you also have to say, like, I made this decision because I truly wanted to eat that food in that moment. So whatever comes with it as a consequence is your responsibility to handle as an adult. So it's not like I'm not losing weight because I'm 55 or I'm not losing weight because I'm a female in menopause or I'm not losing weight because my metabolism is now slower than it was at 30. You're not losing weight because you're not auditing your behavior, not being realistic with your expectations. That's why you're not losing weight. Simple as that. Yeah. Or they're uh, convincing themselves that they're okay with the 5-2-0 diet, right? Locked in. You know that? Like locked in for five days, crushing it. Scales going in the right direction. Oh, perfect. It's the weekend. I'm going to indulge. Two days later, they're back to where they were. Recycle. So five days, you know, great progress. Two days backwards, zero progress on the scale. It's I think your net gain. I think you're being nicer than I do. I, I think it's more of a, <laughs> I think it's more of a three, four, zero diet because yeah. the problem is, is people are so restrictive. Yeah. Right. Like if you're not planning and prepping your food, you're probably going to eat like this is everybody's favorite breakfast is a cup of coffee. Right? Like, I don't drink coffee until like 10 or 11 in the morning after multiple bottles of water and multiple meals because I don't want that caffeine being the reason why I'm doing things. Right. Like, like caffeine's a great supplement. You know, yep. two to 400 milligrams a day can do a lot of benefit for you on a number of different levels. But if you're having to rely on caffeine, which, by the way, is not even really going to jazz you up at three in the afternoon because you haven't eaten all day. Guess what's a lot more energy dense than caffeine is? Eat some fucking carbs. <laughs> right. Like, like one of my favorite things to do is just be like, hey, instead of drinking your coffee in the morning, have 16 ounces of water, immediately eat a breakfast and then watch how much better your energy is going to be. 
Yep. So now that when lunchtime comes, you're not ravenously hungry. Or if you're one of these people that ends up like working through lunch because I forgot to eat, like set a fucking alarm. Yeah. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get the dinner, especially if you have children, you're going to pick off their plate. Then by the time you're done with dishes, this, this, and that, you start to relax for the night. That's when all the shit starts to happen. You start to get into the cupboards. You're not eating whole oh, yeah. food. You're eating a bunch of shit. And you're not even thinking about how much is going in versus if you just ate three to four square meals a day. You wouldn't have to snack. And like, I'm sorry, but like adults shouldn't be snacking unless the intention is I want a snack and I know I can control it. Right. Right. I love it. Okay. I lied one more because <laughs> I, I just love, I love where you're coming from. Cause you're like a real world coach that has moved online versus like the 24 year old internet life coach. Oh my God. I know. I know. So you just come at this from a totally different angle. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, helping people focus on what's practical versus what the internet experts will tell you is optimal. Oh God. Um, you have to earn optimal. Mm. Like most people are not ready for optimal yet. Like just do something for long enough for it to become a habit first. Like you don't need to worry about what the best workout program is or what the best macro split is. Cause those things are going to be variable anyway. Like, do you even have a foundational way that you eat? Like, can you tell me how much protein you consume on a daily basis? If you can't answer that question, stop worrying about optimal. Right. If you can't tell me what happens during a leg extension as far as a joint action, don't tell me what the optimal workout is. Like, figure out that <laughs> a leg extension is knee flexion and extension. If you know that, then maybe we could start to work on optimal. Right. But like, even for me, who's been doing this for 25 years and has been eating a certain way for 20 of them, even I'm not really it. Right now, especially with my injury, like I'm not at the point where I, I need to worry about optimal. I just need to worry about recovery. So when you start to reach the higher echelons of training and nutrition acumen and understanding, then you can start to worry about optimal. But for now, we got and, and I'm, I'll shit on a few people just because I don't care. And they'll probably never hear this anyway because they don't listen to anybody else but themselves. <laughs> but like guys like Andrew Huberman or Peter Atia, like while every once in a while they may say something decent, they say so much shit that makes people have to go down these rabbit holes of like, research and this and i have to rub my feet in the grass at exactly 10 a.m or if i don't get the sunlight <laughs> in my eyes for 14 minutes or i don't do the cold plunge right after i work like you don't you eat you drink four bottles of wine a week you eat mostly shit that's out of a restaurant you train suboptimally three days a week at a class that you're not even paying attention to why are you worried about sunning your eyes and rubbing your feet in the grass <laughs> like, that's not going to be the reason why you get leaner or more muscular that's going to be just one more way to distract you away from the shit you have to do right but that stuff's not sexy like telling somebody the basics isn't sexy it doesn't sell it doesn't put eyeballs on you and all instagram has become is a place to just get your ideas out there so that more people can look at you because you're the person that's going to be the the sought after expert right. when in reality guys like fucking huberman don't even work with individuals like a your phd sure. is in like I think I forgot what his dissertation was in, but it was something like how the light interacts with your eyeballs. You're not a nutrition okay. expert. Right. You're not a coach. You've never worked with one person in your entire life. How are you, how are you standing on the laurels of giving out advice to people? Like it's, it, it's, yeah. it's like, it's no different than when I go to like ISSN conferences and they're talking about studies that they did on like 22 year old college female athletes. That's not my population. Right. Of course, those people are going to have results because they're in a controlled environment and all the all the variables are being set up for them in a way that works like that doesn't work for 48 year old Mrs. Jones. Yeah, that doesn't work for the 60 pound guy who's overweight and obese and has a testosterone of 150. Yeah. So and we're never going to get research on the populations that need the help because those people are never going to subject themselves to the research. So I don't, I don't, I'm not ever going to live in this world where I have to, like, if it doesn't anecdotally work or, or, or if it doesn't get backed up by a PubMed article, I'm not going to deploy it as a protocol because I was just talking to Dave Tate about this on his podcast. I'm so tired of these coaches that have to sound smart to other coaches and validate themselves with research and articles and like, well, this is the science evidence-based stuff. <laughs> You've never worked with an individual. You have no clue what you're talking about. Like, go and... Go and try to do that thing that's so optimal with 40 old re regular average people and tell me that yeah. it works because yeah. I don't like, of course it's optimal when you're compliant, but how you can't guarantee compliance. Yeah. Like yeah. how are you going to, how are you going to get somebody to do something for 40 days straight? Yeah. Good luck, man. <laughs> no, that's why 75 hard works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, man, this is such great stuff, but I want to switch gears a little bit. 
and talk some business stuff too. Because I just love your your mindset and your approach to business. I love what you're doing. So let's come back and let's talk about this summit a little bit. For starters, really, there's two things I want to know here. Number one, give me the meaning behind the title, right? Because I feel like the title is intentional. And number two, it's hard. If people don't know this, it is hard running an in-person event. So why, when everybody's going virtual, do you decide, I'm going to start hosting an in-person event? Because I honestly believe that, like, all the amazing connections I've made in this business I've made because I've been at virtual events and I've had conversations. Like one of the best stories I'll ever tell you is I met a guy named John Moljo. Shout out to John in New York. 2,000 followers on Instagram. 30-something-year-old bro from New York who I just immediately vibe with because I'm from the East Coast and we just dug yep. each other. This dude runs an amazingly successful gym that you would have never heard about, has paid off the gym loan, has three houses, makes all this money, and he you don't hear shit about him. And that's what yeah. I love. And I'm like, here's a guy who's in his early 30s, who's younger than me, who's got a ton more money than I do, who doesn't have anywhere near the online presence than I do, and he's killing it. And you would have never heard about him unless you went to this event. And he was just a dude in the crowd. Right. You know, I met Mike Dola at the crowd in the crowd, the fucking guy who started Stronger You. You know, I met yeah. Don Saladino. Like all these you meet these people and you connect with them in person and it starts to open up your eyes to the things that you know you could be doing a little bit better. And they're going to start to serve as your reminder for which way you want to shift in this industry. Because a lot of people want to do all these big things, but they never understand how to implement any of the actionable steps. And yeah. there's definitely some, t some conferences that you go to that are woo woo and rah rah. And they're getting you all fired up. And then at the end of the, of the conference, it's just one big sales pitch for a mastermind or some other bullshit. But then there are events like I went to Swiss over the weekend a couple of weeks ago, you know, hosted by Ken Kanakin and Dave Tate. Great people there. Awesome yeah. connectivity. Great information that's practical and tactical. I went to Raise the Bar hosted by Nick Lamb back in, in Dallas in February. I went to Super Coach Summit hosted by the Coach Catalyst guys in Preston, Virginia. Also tactical. You go to these events and you realize that you're not crazy. Like you're, you're in this business and you're not alone. Yeah, And I think sometimes when you're working out of your apartment and you have like this like little team of people that you're connected to, you forget that there's a bigger picture out there. And not to mention the fact that like when you're in these crowds, it these people are – there's some people that are just greatly ahead of you. They're just yeah. so far ahead and they force you to level up a little bit. Like you, you lose that level of complacency and you also understand that if I emulate these folks, I can get into this position at some point. And, you know, and then you meet them and write, like when I first met Luca and I told him in person, I'm like, I thought you were going to be the biggest douchebag in the world, <laughs> you know, because that's funny. Yeah. Big, big online presence, very yeah. boisterous, very loud guy and happens to be from Eastern Europe. So am I. So like, that's how we talk where we come yeah. off like we're aggressive. Yeah. Nicest fucking guy in the world who would, who would yeah. literally pick you up at the airport if he asked him to at two in the morning. And you don't get that when you look at him on Instagram. Right. You don't, you don't get that level of connectivity to him as a person and then pick his brain for five minutes. So instead of going to these conferences and taking pictures with Lane Norton and asking for Alan Aragon to sign your book, like ask them fucking right. questions about how they got to where they got. Yeah. Like stop chasing clout to stand next to the, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants, so to speak. Ask them how they became giants. Like start to really yeah. immerse yourself into this community and learn from the best. And these conferences are the best way to do it. And unfortunately, people are just on, like some of these coaches have the audacity to charge five, seven hundred bucks a month, and they're not willing to pay back into their continued education. Yeah, like they're not willing to spend a dime to get better at what they do, but they're going to keep upping their rates. I just had a woman yesterday who signed up with me. Her rate went from two fifty to five hundred, and no added service. And what? the guy and the guy told her he was like, "Well, I think you should value me higher because I'm." better at what I do now than I did six months ago. And she's like, how? how? She was like, how? How are you, you better? twice as good in six months? Right. Like what, 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 what magic pill or potion did you take to make you twice as good as you were before? Right. And where's my extra service for that extra $250? What else am I getting? Sure. He's sure. like, well, you know, my education cost me all this money and this and that. She's like, cool. That's great. But what am I getting out of it as a paying customer? And right. one of the things that Mike Dole always talks about is like, we have to make coaching affordable enough for people to stay in it long enough to see the result. So we can't just inflate these prices. Like, yes, our costs are high. Like I fucking travel, like just for November, it's going to cost me three grand to go to 
Silverback Summit in Austin for Allie Gilbert's event. And I'm going to spend another grand to go to New York City to go to Kenny Santucci's Strong New York event. Kenny. But to go to these events, the reason why I go is because I get to meet these people who I've been following and learning from for years. And then when they become part of your network, you just become that much more powerful as a coach. Yeah. You're just doing yourself a disservice sitting in your apartment waiting for shit to happen to you. Well, look, I think ultimately those are the people that phase themselves out. You yes. know, yeah. like, like it's like anything else. If you want to get fit, you have to get uncomfortable in a gym. If you yep. want to become a better coach, you have to be uncomfortable with your continuing education. Yes. Right. And you can't just do that. I mean, look, do you sell an online course of any shape or form? I not to, I'm not B2B. I'm going to eventually do an online course B2C. Yeah. Um, just because it's recurring revenue that's easy, but the expectation will be if you can't afford coaching, you can at least go down to this self-guided product. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, you can sell intellectual property all day long and there's a lot of people doing it. I mean, I just, I just posted that I'm doing a virtual summit as a lead up to the live event in March. Yep. But even with the virtual summit, I reached out to some lesser known coaches who never had a chance and never had the podium to speak. And I said, Hey, would you want to do this and get your name out there? And they're like, Oh my God, please. I'm so thankful for this opportunity. And they were like hungry, yeah. you know, like mid-level coaches that people haven't really heard about yet. And this is going to be their foray into getting on, getting in the public eye a little bit. And to me, like, that's what this is all about. Like I, like somebody was at, Jason Brown was asking me yesterday on a live. He's like, are you going to speak at your own event? I'm like, no, <laughs> cause it's not, <laughs> because it's, it's not for me to showcase me. It's for me to showcase these educators and for me to provide a value to the people buying tickets in those seats. It's not me to jerk off on, on myself and say, my God, I'm so amazing. Come right. look at me at my event. Like, you know, Andrew Coates would get mad at me for saying that because he's like, you should speak <laughs> at your own event. I'm sure. sure, I'm sure Luca would probably tell me the same thing. Sure. But, I, I, I come from a lens of the more cups I fill, the more mine gets filled. Yeah. And yeah. it'll come back to me at some, like I lost 30 grand on the event in 2023. I had to fucking beg my parents for money because <laughs> I, 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 I was so, I was 28% on credit cards, just paying it off. Right. And that's what people don't see. Like people don't see the amount of effort that it goes in. Like, and with the event, like it's $150,000 to run this event. That's the initial They're not cost. cheap. Yeah. Especially the way that I do it. You're getting three meals a day. You're getting open bar happy hour every single night. I got comedians coming at night to play at the happy hours. Like this is like, this is not like a, you get, you buy my VIP ticket and you can maybe get a dinner. Like this is like you, right. everybody's a VIP. Right. And like I started the price points at 548, which is a fucking steal. Like you couldn't eat in Vegas for two days for $500. No. No. So, and that's what people don't understand. Like the 30, 40 year olds get the value of these events because they've been to them and they see how cool they are. But the 20 year olds, because every time like somebody shares one of my things, like what my guerrilla marketing tactic is I DM them, I thank them and I say, Hey, are you coming to Vegas in March? And overwhelmingly it's like, well, I don't know what's happening in March. It's like, well, yeah, you do. This event is going to be on. You should be there. <laughs> Your yeah. clients will understand. They'll back you up because they want you to get better because you're going to deliver a better product to them. And if you make the plan now, you know what you're doing in March. Like, stop being non-committal, and stop saying that you're going to do all this shit to level up. Or here's your opportunity. Like, I'm not. And of right. course, like, yes, I'm trying to sell my event because I don't want to fucking lose money on it this year. Sure. But this is. It's not like it's something that people don't need. Like, this is a necessity for you. Yeah. Like, it's a necessity. Like, and to get to Vegas, it's inexpensive. The rooms are 109 dollars a night. Which, by the way, if you've ever been to that's an event, super cheap. I like, saw that super cheap. I mean, that's for Vegas. Yeah. I mean, I I paid. I paid almost three hundred dollars a night to stay at a hotel in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. And like here, yeah. you're staying at the Virgin, where it's beautiful inside. Yeah, and you're paying one hundred nine bucks. People just don't conceptualize this stuff because it's always like, well, oh my god, I can't spend all this money. Like you're going to make that money back tenfold. Yeah, like yeah. the people so, that you meet, the connections that you make, are going to be invaluable for the rest of your career. Here's the thing: like, if you've never run an event, you have no idea how expensive it is to run an in-person event. Like, cause I was going through all this cause I've run nine big events, oh, right. On top how, of all the small little events. I mean, we're talking like 80 big? to a hundred plus people. Yeah. Dude, I'm easily showing out 30 K before I have any money coming back in. Right. And again, we're talking Indianapolis. We're not talking Vegas, but I can tell you this. Oh, breakfast. Oh, breakfast. What's that cost him? $10? No, try breakfast is probably 40 bucks ahead, right? Like they have no idea how yeah. expensive it is yep. and how these places just rake you over the coals yep. as far as like how much money they're going to get out of you. So like when I saw that, I was like, dude, this is such a steal. 
Oh, right? I mean, even at nine ninety eight, which is going to be my, my regular price, like if you think about it, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like dinner alone in Vegas for one person is probably if, like, if you just sat at like the easiest restaurant in the hotel, probably fifty bucks. Right? Yeah, yeah. Two hours of an open bar. Let's say you have three cocktails in Vegas, twelve fifteen bucks a piece. Yeah, that's another fifty sixty dollars right there. Yeah, and then you have breakfast and lunch. Let's add another thirty a piece there, if not Easy. more. Yeah free coffee, free water, all this shit just included. Like what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create such a pleasant experience with all these amenities to where people, if they get even nothing out of the education, they at least have a good time. Yeah. Because when I travel to events, I travel to events to disconnect from coaching. Yeah. Like, it's my, it's my time to be coached versus having to coach. Yes. Like, I get to go, I get to immerse, I get to learn, I get to shut off. I party a little bit. Like I don't really drink or go out. But when I go to events, I always drink and go out because I want to be part right. of it. Like I want to enhance my experience with these individuals who I never get to see. Yeah. And to me, it's like going to, with a bunch of my friends. It's like, this is fucking awesome. Like I'm going to Austin in a couple of weeks for Ali Gilbert's event. I'm fired up. Like all the, like Kirsten Thibodeau is going to be there. Luke Lehman's going to be there. My, my podcast partner, Jimmy's coming with me. All these other coaches I know in Austin are going to be coming out. Like this is what it's all about. And like, it's just not have, it's not happening online. And like, yes, courses are amazing. Yeah. But how many people buy courses and don't even take them? Yeah. Like they buy oh. these courses and they sit in their email box for three months until they finally decide like, Oh shit, I should probably watch this. And then it's self guided. So there's no sense of urgency. Right. So it's never really yeah. getting like digested or absorbed. So you have like, when you're in this live event, you learn directly from the person. And if that person resonates with you, boom, here's your opportunity to learn directly from them. And maybe they do offer a mentorship or maybe they do offer a little bit of a deeper dive course and you can get it from them on a discount. Like these people aren't going to be selling bullshit. They're selling stuff that's tactical and ready to go. Right. And that's what I made sure to have. Cause I don't want like conceptual influencers. I want like tactical practitioners who have been doing this for 20 years. Yeah. Well, I, I just love kind of one of your bullet points in your IG was like the best experience you'll ever have at a fitness conference. And I love that. I love that. And I think one of the things too, you kind of mentioned it, but maybe not this directly. Like when I go to events like that, you might be tired at the end, right? Just because you are going, you're in a classroom, right? You're taking notes, a lot of cognitive load, and then you're going to go out and you're going to stay up too late, yeah. right? Even though we're fitness people and we're a little bit older, we might do that. But man, I walk out of those things and I'm so rejuvenated. Like, like that's what I think people miss too. Like, yeah, you can get the X's and O's tactics from an online course. And part of the reason I asked earlier is because I sell an online course, right? I know you, <laughs> how, how you sell that and frame it and there's benefit to that. But look, if I had my druthers and it was either you take my online course or you come work with me for three days in person, I'm choosing in person all day, every day because it's so much more valuable and you get so much more out of it. Well, think about it this way. And I, I always make this analogy. Let's say like, I don't know, let's say your, your favorite chef is Bobby Flay. And Bobby Flay has a burger course. He's got a burger joint, Bobby Flay's Burgers, right? Bobby's right. Burger, whatever it is. And he, he offers an online course where I'm going to teach you how to build and make these burgers that I make at the restaurant. All right, cool. You're going to buy the online course. You're going to throw your laptop on your kitchen counter and you're going to figure – and it's going to be like a Pinterest thing where <laughs> right. Pinterest, it looked amazing. And then when you make it, it looks like hot shit. <laughs> but, when, but let's say Bobby Flay offered that same course in person where you're actually able to like connect with him, ask him questions, pick his brain. He can sit there and evaluate you. I bet you're going to make a hell of a better burger when you're in person with him than you are going to be at your kitchen counter at home. Yeah. And this is what people don't understand is like when it's in like, yeah, we have the ability to be online and it's great, but that's really reserved for people that are very good at self-starting. And they're yeah. very good at being able to be intrinsically motivated, but most people aren't. And what I always challenge people, especially at my event, and I always ask people this question at the end of it, like, were you able to come home three days later after that high and that motivation wore off and actually were able to implement something into your coaching practice that made you a better coach? And almost yep. 99 out of 100 people said yes. Yep. Whereas like I've been to events where if you ask me that question, I'd be like, yeah, once the motivation wore off, nothing changed. Like yeah. I came home, I didn't feel like I got a benefit. I actually felt like I spent money and time I didn't need to spend. Yes. And there's no worse feeling than traveling halfway across the country and then having that review. Uh, yeah. And, and, I, and it's also because the expectation is set so high. Like I've, I've seen some events where they're charging twelve or $1,300 for a VIP ticket. And like you're getting one meal out of it. 
and you're getting like a coupon for like a free drink in an open bar or not even an open <laughs> bar. It's a cash bar, but they give you like a ticket for it. And you're like, what the fuck did I just spend $1,200 on? Like I saw the same presentation that I've seen the last three years. No new data. It'd be like going to see a comedian who has no new material. Yeah. Like at least change the slide deck a little bit. Like I, I mean, right. I, I've literally seen people present the same slides at three different events. Yeah. Like, get, yeah. like you're getting, and some of these people are actually getting paid to speak. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> it's fucking it's insane. Wild. Like how, how little integrity do you have? How little do you care about the audience that you're just going to show up and half ass it? Yeah. That's sad. I mean, I gave people a shot last year to speak that never spoke in public ever in their life. And they fucking crushed it. Like Jordan lips, awesome in hypertrophy training came in and killed it. Never spoke a day in his life and was one of the highlights of the event. Connor Harris, who's got a massive online presence as a PT, but he was crushing it doing, he was doing mobility drills in the hallway of the hotel. It was fantastic. <laughs> like having, like while the cleaners were walking by and like people got like, they enjoyed it. They had a killer time, but then they left knowing that there was value there. Like they were able to implement something immediately because they learned something that was tactical versus like, well, you should change your mindset and you should become a better coach because you have more empathy now. <laughs> that doesn't pay the bills. No, it doesn't, man. Okay, big question time. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Aram Gregor... Oh, my gosh. I knew I was going to mess up Don't bother name. the last Gregory, name. Gregory, yeah. <laughs> Aram, one piece of advice, what would it be? Save your money better. Mm. Um, I mean, I was making shit, $120,000 in finance a year with $30,000 bonuses. And I put all of it up my nose. Um, uh, I mean, I was, I was so, and my parents were shit with money too, growing up. So I never had a good role model of like saving. Right. And I'm not saying like, sit there and like, Oh, I can't do this. Cause I have to save money. Like live your life. I, like, I think like life is short and we do have right. to at least be able to enjoy ourselves a little bit. But this idea that like, you know, like, so many people now are giving me the, the hesitation or giving me the um, the objection of like, well, I can't afford to go to Vegas in March. So you can't afford a thousand bucks. Like I have two credit cards that have $30,000 limits on them now, luckily because I've been able to run these events using credit cards. No, right. But like, okay, let's say you, let's say you put yourself into $3,000 in debt because you just did some continued education. You don't think you're going to make that money back. Right. Like, that's like, this is what you save for. This is what you like saving money a little bit like having some income that you can like comfortably take out and use for these types of things is what allows you that financial freedom. And that's the reason why you became an online coach. Yeah. Like if I knew what I knew today, because I know how hard it is because back then I didn't know it was too easy for me back then to make money when I was in finance. Cause I just showed up and I got a paycheck. Right. There was no value to it. Now I know where that work comes from. It's all me. If I don't make, if I don't show up every day, I don't get paid and I don't get paid. I don't pay my $3,000 rent every month. Yeah. And like I live in Southern California, like shit ain't cheap here. <laughs> so like yeah. I, I, I don't have a large appetite for money, but what I do know is, is that if I want to spend it, I want to have it to be able to yeah. spend it. And if I don't need it, cause I'm not spending it on stupid frivolous shit, it's going to sit there until it's ready to get put into something that's going to enhance my quality of life or my business. Yeah. See, that's just such a great way to look at things. And I mean, this is something that I think I learned pretty early on. I was reading this book. I was like 23 years old. Of course, I can't remember the title of the book now, but one of the big things it talked about was invest 10% of your income. And maybe it doesn't have to be 10, right? It could be five, two, whatever, but start setting money aside for continuing education early, right? Like if you're not investing in yourself, why would you expect somebody to invest more in you? It just never made never made sense. And I'm like, yeah. And so I did, even before I had the money to do it and the funds to do it. And I feel like that was a huge springboard for me. And learning that at an early age was super important. Well, you're lucky because a lot of people don't ever get to that point. Again, I think it's just because we grew up different. Absolutely. The focuses Absolutely. were different. The emphasis was different. It wasn't about, we were able to delay some gratification for a while. We knew how hard it was to work hard. We knew the value of hard work. We knew the value of the long game. <laughs> And I just feel like that's escaping the population at such an alarming rate these days where people are just expecting shit to to just come easy. And yeah. it's supposed to happen fast. And whether it's weight loss, whether it's building your business, whether it's being in the best possible relationship with these, with a significant other, it's going to take time and you're going to fall on your face nine, nine out of ten times. But if you get up every single time and learn a lesson from a mistake that you made, there's no such thing as mistakes. Like 
Yeah. Not making mistakes means you haven't tried to do shit. Absolutely. Like you just sat there and waited for life to pass you by. Like I, I always ask people like, how you doing? And I have this one client that always says surviving. And I'm like, that is no <laughs> yeah. way to go through life. Like that yeah. attitude is so shitty. And she's just generally a very negative person in any way. Yeah. And I'm like, you don't think that your, your lack of weight loss, your lack of personal fulfillment stems from your shitty attitude towards this life. Yeah. Like, I don't care if it's fucking Absolutely. Monday, Thursday, or like, I hate anybody that looks forward to Friday. Yeah. Like I love Mondays. Yeah. I, 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 I get to go to work. Fuck yeah. I spring out of bed at four 30 in the morning, like ready to make posts, ready to engage with my audience on Instagram, ready to get to my video form check reviews for my clients. Like I'm fired up that I have this yeah. opportunity to touch so many lives and hopefully make a difference in somebody's existence. How are you not getting excited for that? Like, why are you still waiting for the weekends to live your life? Yeah. I love that. It's such a great, great viewpoint. Okay. So last but not least, I'm, I've got what I call the extended lightning round. So I've got a couple questions, but then I tagged you on IG yesterday and a couple people chimed in that had stuff they wanted you to answer too. So okay. number one, this one's from me. What's the biggest lesson you've learned hosting a podcast? Uh, I think the biggest lesson I learned from hosting our podcast was um, just be as authentic as possible. Like don't, I don't love using scripts or I don't love having a plan. Like I know who we're interviewing and I know what they're good at. So I just kind of right. tailor make that, that, that questioning to them. And I let the questions be formulated by the answers. Mm -hmm. So like I may yeah. have an initial question, like, like we had Eric Trexler on a couple of days ago and we were asking him obviously about nutrition research, but then as he was answering questions, I was like, you were writing stuff down today. I was writing stuff down and that was helping me make the next question. Yep. So you may have the best laid plan for like the perfect podcast, but like, that's not what people want to hear. Right. Like, I think the reason why mind pump is so successful is because they bullshit for 45 minutes and then they give you tactics at the end and that keeps you engaged the whole time Yeah. versus like, I'm just going to come at you with every bit of information. Like we have fun. Like <laughs> my, my podcast partner, Jimmy and I are very good friends, but arguably probably best friends. We're both degenerates. We're both, we both come from <laughs> our own line of all of our own problems. We have our own idiosyncrasies and we just let our audience hear it and it's unfiltered it's raw it's real and if you don't like it you don't listen to it and if you like it you probably love it yeah yeah that's like the number one rule of marketing right that's why they call it magnetic marketing the people that love you hey man you're going to attract them and the people you don't want repel them and they're not they don't care anyways no. right they're not your people nope. so who cares no nope. okay in our convos leading up to the show you talked about being an og in the game and i love that I love that analogy. What does being an OG mean to you? Just somebody who's been able to last like the test of time and the different transitional periods in our industry, because our industry has shape shifted so many different times. And, you know, we live in a, in a, our industry is very good at being able to take something and just make it the most important and most current <laughs> thing in the world. Yep. So I think anybody who's been able to be a coach or a trainer for, for, I would even say at this point, like seven years plus, like, that's a badge of honor because the the, yeah. the churn rate in our business is so high, whether it's in-person personal training, whether, you know, they start in this career path that they think they're going to do so well on, but then they refuse 5 a.m. sessions. They don't want to work Friday night. They don't want to get up on Saturday morning to service clients. They don't want to work on Sundays because that's too much work and I need to have all these boundaries. Like those people aren't going to last. Right. Like, I chose to be an entrepreneur because I don't mind working seven days a week. And yeah. working seven days a week doesn't mean that I'm sitting in front of a computer every hour of every day it means that I'm accessible to the people that know I'm accessible and that's what matters. And being an OG means you could just last these different technological adaptations and all these other things that are happening. But as long as you can still keep some personal touch to it, I think you can be in this business forever and make a very lucrative career for yourself. Agreed. Okay. Number three, this one's from Nick. Nick says, how should I approach getting my first few online clients without seeming desperate? Seem desperate. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Explain. Like, I think hat in hand is the best way to do things. Like, be like, hey, guys, I'm a new coach. I have this level of knowledge. You probably can't afford somebody who's got more experience than me, but you probably can't afford me. So here's my very low rate. And here's mm -hmm. me being able to build my stripes. And I would really love the opportunity for you to be able to help me while I help you. I like that like, a lot. Why not? Yeah. Like, I mean, I was fucking begging for ticket sales towards the end of the year last year for the event. Like begging. Sure. I'm like, guys, I'm literally fucked if you guys don't come. 
<laughs> like if you believe right. in me, if you believe in this event, if you believe in my message, if you want to support me, like, people start GoFundMe pages for their fucking cat. Yeah. And $40,000 yeah. comes pouring in. So if you're just authentic about stuff unapologetically and just say, hey, I need your help. And part of you helping me by gathering data and being able to work with people and, and build these repetitions that I need. Like, are you going to have the best coach in the world? I don't know yet because I don't know how, how kind of a coach I am yet. But let me right. at least show you what I'm capable of at a, at a relatively reasonable rate that you won't be able to find anywhere else. Yeah, I love it. Nick, you better uh, use that advice, man. You better <laughs> let me know how that goes. And DM me if you do. Yes. All right. Next one comes from Anestis. Anestis wants to know, how can you do long-term programming when you're working with minimal equipment? I, I would ask what long-term programming means. And I would also want to understand what minimal equipment means. So let's assume yeah, it's fair. that she's trying to periodize training. I would ask, is the population of people that you're working with even requiring some level of periodization? Because like, I don't change my clients' workouts very often. Right. I may go from bilateral to unilateral just to give them a little bit of, you know, anti-rotational stability ability and stuff like that. But I'm not like overhauling their program once every eight to 10 weeks. Like you, if you haven't mastered the shit that's on your plate, I'm not going to change it. So yeah. I don't think you need to, to think long term as far as programming, unless you have athletes who have very specific skill sets that they're trying to round out. Like if you have an athlete who's an athlete, a performance athlete or a strength athlete, yeah, like those people probably need to have a very long term, fifty two week plan that you're accounting for all these things. But even then, like you need to be able to adjust and adapt because their lives are not going to be linear for fifty two weeks. Yeah. So you may have one. Well, who knows? Maybe they get injured. Maybe they maybe they lose their job. Maybe they lose their focus. Maybe they don't want to be an athlete at, at, at week seventeen. So just understand what the immediate vision looks like and and what their goal is. If that person's goal is aesthetics. You absolutely do not need to periodize any, any, any training whatsoever. Like progressive overload lends itself to just continual progress constantly. You don't need yeah. conjugate. You don't need five, three, one. You don't need deload <laughs> weeks. You don't need any of that shit. Yeah. Now it's a totally different story. If you have performance based athletes, absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Erica wants to know, what do you think about intermittent fasting for men and does it negatively impact total protein intake? Yeah. I mean, I just never understood, like, if you like eating breakfast, eat breakfast. If you think that intermittent fasting is going to be a, a, a shorter route to fat loss, then it's not any superior to keto or to just a regular calorie controlled diet. Um, you know, and I think, yes, it's going to be a lot harder to get protein because now that individual only has eight hours to eat versus 12 or 15 hours to eat. So if they're already having trouble with meeting their normal requirements, why would you put a, a limitation even greater onto them? I would want to instruct those people and audit their diet now and see how they're eating on a regular basis before ever using intermittent fasting. And intermittent fasting's biggest benefit is digestive. Yeah, It's not like autophagy and all this other bullshit that they're talking about has no actual fat loss benefit superior to anything else. Like some people will report cognitive function improves a little bit, but that's probably because it's a placebo effect because you're just like so focused on your next meal that like everything gets, <laughs> it's almost like taking an Adderall at like 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Like you're going to get fired up. Right. So I think if you have digestive issues, yeah, great. Delay meal timing and get some more gastric emptying to, to happen to be able to maybe reduce some of your GI symptoms. But if it's just fat loss focused, I don't think anybody needs intermittent fasting. Yeah. It's just a pain well, in the ass. It, it comes back to your, your calories comment too, right? People want to act like calories aren't a thing. Well, look, you can still screw yourself up with intermittent fasting if you're, all you're doing is eating garbage, right? <laughs> like like that window isn't magical from a fat loss perspective. Higher instances of binge eating and overeating documented scientifically mm. from intermittent there fasting. Like people, I think about it. If you don't eat for X amount of hours, then you have this small time small window of opportunity to eat you're just like jamming stuff in so quality yeah. of food will go down and being able to regulate consumption and having normal hunger and fullness patterns is going to be dissipated for sure all right last but not least what's next for aram what are you working on what are you excited about anything i mean the event really is like my baby right now like that's the thing i'm trying to put the most eyeballs on because i just can't like i can't afford to not fill the house this time. Like my, I got 135 tickets sold so far. So that's pretty good for an event that's four months away. 
Yeah, that's but I, great. I think my break even was like somewhere closer to 250 people. So I have another 115 yeah. or so tickets to buy. So if you're listening to this, buy a fucking ticket. Make sure I don't go broke. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's the event. And then as far as like business is concerned, the next real tactic that I'm going to deploy is creating some type of a DIY lower ticket ability for people to just join the, the coaching ecosystem. So if you can't afford group at 275 or you can't afford one-on-one at like four to 500 a month, here's your $99 a month DIY thing where maybe you're going to get a little tiny bit of support from me, but the expectations need to be low that this is self-guided and it's going to be only right. what you put into it. Uh, but I just, I know that that's the logical step for some recurring revenue that's passive. Um, and I know that that's just that, that part of that Ascension model that Joe Coleman uses of having three different products. And I just think that's yeah. a genius way of doing it. So again, going to conferences, meeting people like Jill, having yeah. that conversation, having her be like, listen, you're fucking good at what you do. Have different offerings. Yeah. And she's sharp. She's awesome. She's very sharp. Um, yeah. And Hans Shante, her business partner, is going to be speaking at the event. Um, so Shante yeah, just, is the real deal too, man. Yeah. Both yeah. sharp. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't listen, man. I don't mess around. If I'm going to pick people to be on that stage, which by the way, watch your email because I'm sure you'll be getting an invite soon. <laughs> um, I just, I, I want people to get real information from people who have done it. Like you're not going to, these business coaches who are hitting you in the DMS at, at 27 years old. who's like, I'm going to get you a million dollars. It's like, why do you still live at home with your parents? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. It's the 24 year old life coach, man. And I just, tell you all the mistakes you're making for $5,000 a month. You know, go to my mastermind and learn directly from me when I'm still learning from my parents. That's right. Aram, man, this has been awesome. Really appreciate your time. Where can my listeners find out more about you, the event and all the great stuff you're working on? Uh, just at four weeks to the beach is my Instagram. It's the number four and the number two. So that's where I spend I'm either responding to text messages or responding to DMs. So if you ever have anything you need from me at all, you want to yell at me, you want to support me, you want to ask me questions, just DM me. I'll always answer you. Um, the event website is realcoachessummit2023.com. I'm an idiot and I bought the domain name 2023. <laughs> so now I, have to, now I have to keep it, which I think is actually kind of funny. Uh, yeah. It just shows how imperfect I truly am. Yeah. And how much it doesn't really matter to me. Like it'll just live like that forever. So hopefully if this event is still going in 2030, it'll just be funny that it still says 2023. But <laughs> tickets are on there. Details of the event are on there. Speakers are on there. Their bios are up. All the details that you'll need are on there. But um, just those two places. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Well, I'll make sure I get all those links in the show notes. And again, Aram, this has been amazing, man. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Mike, I thank you for allowing me this hour and 17 minutes to, <laughs> to, to do what I do. I love it, man. Hey, we made the world better today, my friend. I hope so. I hope so. And by the way, for any of your listeners, like if you have any like critiques, anything at all, like I, I love feedback and it makes me better. So if you want to like be like you suck or this sucked, whatever, please. Like <laughs> I want to know because I can. Then I'll just sharpen my spear. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, thanks again, my guy. I appreciate you. Thank you, sir. 